Welcome to the Core Women Podcast, the place for women entrepreneurs, authors, and self-starters looking to build community and gain valuable insight through expert interviews with women at the top of their game. Join your host, podcaster, producer, expert coach, entrepreneur, and author, Dr. Summer Watson, as she aims to inspire and empower you through these candid conversations. Lean in and embrace the journey. It's time to start the show. Here's your host, Dr. Summer Watson. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Elisa Romeo, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, an intuitive speaker, co-host of the Holy and Human podcast, and author of Meet Your Soul, and co-author of Holy Love, The Essential Guide to Soul-Fulfilling Relationships. We have so much to talk about today, so let's just jump right into this and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before we get started and get into your professional background, your book and your newly released book, let's talk a bit about your past, such as where you grew up and how you were conditioned or what was modeled for you in relation to love. Mm. I was born outside of Chicago in a little suburb. When I was 10, we moved across the country to this little island that I live on currently, which is outside of Seattle, 35 minute ferry ride from downtown Seattle. And I lived here through my kind of formative years. And then in college, I went to University of Washington, which is a top 10 research school for psychology. So it was very much where the type of clinical work I'm drawn to was only used as jokes (laughs) in class. It was more about rats and mazes and taking statistics. And so I didn't really understand like the draw to psychology, how they were doing it. I'm not a, I'm not like a built researcher, but I took speech communication courses as well. I was a double major. And that was really cool because that program was small and had a lot of psychological, it was, it was kind of breaking down how we communicate interpersonally and looking at through psychological lens. So I really love that program. And then while I was about to graduate, I found a course catalog for Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, and that's a Jungian depth psychological program. And when I looked through the catalog, I was like, if there was a dream school of mine, like if I could create just my dream school, this was the course catalog. So I didn't know how I was going to figure it out, but I knew I had to just like like my life kind of depended on getting to the school. It felt like a mist into Avalon experience. And um, so I started volunteering at a suicide line because I knew you needed, you know, some hours to get in. And that was really interesting. I discovered there that I was more, I was waitressing also at the time. And I was like, I feel way more stressed out bringing people their coffee when they're demanding it than when someone has a gun to their head, which I think really says something <laughs> about who I am as a person. Cause I was like, I want to talk about things that are really meaningful and crucial to people. So did that went to Pacifica? I mean, I had had, it's kind of like, which version of the story do I tell? Because really one reason I wanted to go to Pacifica is I had these mystic experiences growing up mm-hmm. and I had this longing in me to understand where they came from. And if they were crazy, because I think the narrative from my biochemist father and mathematician mother was very much, if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. Mm. And yet I was having intuitive experiences that were validated in the physical world. And I needed to understand the difference between like a psychotic break and a- an opening, a spiritual opening um, for my own kind of understanding. And went to Pacifica and discovered there is a big difference between those two things and really had a lot of training and kind of rock stars in the field of consciousness explaining to me. Um, Stan Groff, who's the head of the transpersonal psychology movement, was a professor. Rick Tarnas, who wrote this beautiful book, The Passion of the Western Mind. And a lot of working with Marion Woodman, I really came into myself there and started Mm -hmm. to understand, you know, my nature. And then when I was at Pacifica, I had an out-of-body experience, like literally while I was on the campus. I um, had just left a really intense uh, workshop with Stan Groff and Rick Tarnas and went out onto the lawn and started going into an altered state. And I had a friend who was like, 
you look like you're going into a trance. Do you want me to like hold space for you? And I really trusted him. Mm -hmm. And when we went into a back room and I left my body, so I could see my physical form laying down and I could see my face and I could see my t-shirt. And I just remember being really shocked. Like I'm existing as consciousness not in the physical container of my body. Mm -hmm. What does that mean about mm -hmm. reality and our eternity? Because I didn't think I could really exist. Mm -hmm. I thought once my heart stopped beating, I would just like disappear. Um, and then I was moved into this cloud of love. And then from that kind of energy, which was my soul, I had memories of who I was before I was Elise Romeo. And it felt like every question I'd ever had was immediately answered. And I understood the soul contract with my family and why I was here in this lifetime and all kinds of things. And it was a long six hour experience actually. And when I came out of it, I could see everyone else's souls around me, like as energies, like it looked like mm -hmm. glowing balls of light. And I could hear telepathically things the souls wanted me to say to the humans in front of me, which mm -hmm. did not make me comfortable um, as an ego. Yeah. So that was kind of my journey of how to in integrate that information into my therapy practice. Cause then I found when I just started to say the things that I was hearing, people would look at me and say, how do you know that? I've never told anyone that. And it feels like you're speaking my deepest truth. And so I really had to get out of my way. So that's kind of the reason I tell that story is that's kind of, it is who I am and it is how I see everything. And I can't not see things that way. Right. It's almost like I had a life review and I could see the point of our lives is to really align and integrate and embody our most sacred, loving, all-knowing self, which is our soul. And as egos, we're really blocked from how much of that we have access to, but it's as quick as our next breath and intention to be able to access that like wealth of information. So all my work, Holy Love and Meet Your Soul are like really practically, I know it sounds funny to say practically after that story, but it's, <laughs> it's actually, I am a Capricorn. So it's like, Actually, I'm really about efficiency. I'm kind of actually about like, how do we take these big spiritual concepts and make them really, really approachable, relatable, accessible? So yeah, so that was that's well, a, that's I love background. It. So thank you for that, because there are many people that I have talked to that are lost because they may not fit into the typical way of life in regards to understanding the intuitive part of themselves, what that looks like, the soulful part. I actually just talked to somebody and she's featured on this podcast actually this week who was an intuitive and she had a similar story where she said, I would see these balls of energy, these lights of energy. And I just thought, wow, nobody else sees them. Am I crazy? What's yeah. going on? And yet she goes off to college and she says, you know, I go into this party and this guy, he's like this, this typical country song. And he says, oh my gosh, I I've lost my girlfriend. I'm feeling down. And she's like, and I was feeling fine before the party, but I go into the party and I'm just, I take all of this in as an intuitive, as somebody who's very emotive. And she's like, I had to learn that it's okay to do that, but how do I claim space for myself in the world where I'm walking through a big box door and I'm like, boom, 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 just getting hit with all these emotions. How do I do that? Yeah. A lot so, of people are unconscious empaths instead right. of being conscious empaths. And so yeah. they're affected by it, but you'll say, are you an empath? And most people say, what does that even mean? You know? Right. And then when you start yeah. to explain it, um, it's a lot of light bulbs start to go off in terms of their own understanding of themselves, their own self-care, stuff like that. It's so crucial that we have a lot of support and resources around it. And this is why I love these types of conversations, because they really open up the door of understanding differences, our differences and understanding that we process things in different ways and we understand the world in different ways. And so not to dismiss that the and mainstream science like kind of ideology is still really bad about um, recognizing what it is to be an empath there's a little bit of work around uh, mirror what's it called mirror neurons I believe it's yeah. called mm -hmm. um, but 
thank goodness we've gotten so much better in the last 10 years of understanding the spectrum of autism and that people can be on the spectrum and what is it being to, to be neurotypical or atypical. Right. And yet the reality is there's a lot of people on this planet that are psychic, that are mystics, right. that are seers, that are having different experiences than the mainstream, but they're really, really marginalized yeah. and called crazy or con artists because there's actually just like no space for that reality. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is my passion to really support those people because I love those people. (laughs) They're some (laughs) of my favorite people. I mean, I'm biased, but like, I feel like that group is put on the planet to, to be the healers and to help open things up for people. So it's really sad that we're some of the most ostracized Yeah. We have a traditional way of learning. I come up through the ranks also of psychology. I started at Berkeley and I thought, I am just so bored. I, it was the whole concept of memorization and Mm. do I want to do this? Do I want to? And so I dropped it and declared a different major, but yet I took the, some of those foundational courses, graduated from Berkeley, went on to a master's degree in human services, started working in the field and thinking about what it is that I wanted to do and loving the idea of working with people. It totally resonated with me when you said I was more nervous about serving a cup of coffee Mm -hmm. than I was about talking about suicide with somebody and assessing that and what that looked like for that person, what that person's world looked like at that moment and, and how I could potentially be that support system for them. And And I worked in the largest locked facility in the state of California, assessing people who were suicidal, homicidal, and gravely disabled for many years. And so where were you at? Sacramento County Mental Health. I was at the the girls camp in Palo Alto for a while. And and then um, Women's Recovery Association in San Mateo. And I saw mothers and then later saw their daughters. So I really saw like the cycle. Oh, yeah. And you learn a lot about human functioning, the cyclical process, the DNA, but there's a lot of discount to the spiritual factor, you know, because that's not what we're taught. And the girls get so excited. And I do a class in either of the rehabs about kind of like soul work, basically. And I would and I wouldn't necessarily use that term. (laughs) Right. But I would like we're going to do a creative writing exercise. And we're (laughs) going to talk to our wise mind, you know? Yes that would really root people in their recovery because it was that kind of, they would be struggling with maybe the first step of surrendering and what is a higher power. And, um, to have a, ter- I remember one of my first clients, she was very against this idea of a higher power, you know, and like, she was a diehard kind of atheist. And, and, um, and I was like, you don't have to believe in it. Let's just pretend. And I remember she made up this character gnome and, and, and she would just be floundering with her recovery. And every time she asked Gnome something, she would just nail it mm-hmm. with what she needed to do. Like the accuracy and precision of how she would go from just fumbling, very, very unaware ego to just like knowing exactly what she was, what was going on with her. And that's the background of the soul journaling that we talk about in both books, because I really saw kids, anyone, you don't have to be some kind of like awakened person to do this work. You just need to have that intention to talk to that part. And you could say of yourself, or you don't even have to believe it's yourself. It's just like, just pretend and fake it till you make it. You'll be so surprised what happens. And I think what does happen is people start going from beta to theta state in their brain. And I think we start to access real energies that are not normally available to us. So And it is that whole Einstein thing of like, you can't solve a problem from the energy level in which it's created. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the insanity of humans. Like we're going around like, oh, complaining about some relationship issue or like, why is my daughter doing this or whatever it is. And it's like, but we never actually talk to wisdom or love Mm -hmm. for what to do about it. We talk to our friends who might have their own projections or opinions, or we all circle around the spiral and, um, it's wild to me how actually easy it is to just kind of stop <laughs> that problem. Well, and I think a lot of us, it we've been conditioned, right? We've been conditioned yeah. to disengage from ourselves and to listen to those exterior voices and not our own. And that wisdom, as a matter of fact, I was going through your book and I, I was like, oh, man, 
oh man, oh my gosh, this is so good. This is so good. And I thought to myself, I really need to, <laughs> to tell a few friends about this. Book. Oh yeah. Like, right I mean, <laughs> my, the favorite thing I hear from people is like, I got 10 copies for my friends because yeah. I think they know it makes it easier for them because if your friends get it, it's really awesome. I mean, especially this book, because it's yeah. literally about like the four spiritual relationships of like, my greatest like thing I'm so grateful for for Adam, my husband and co-author here is that he is really good at his ego to my soul, the third relationship. So if I'm crabby or stuck, which happens, <laughs> he is amazing at the skill of talking to his soul and my soul about what's going on with me so that the pressure's not on my ego in that moment. And it's such a gift. Mm -hmm. It's literally the greatest gift you can give someone in any relationship with your children or your parents or your friendships is like, it's not always going to be dependent on you having to act a certain way because I know your soul and I'm in relationship and loving that part of you. So it's not always a conditional to me. It's the difference between conditional or unconditional love yeah. of like, are we really anchoring in to that part of them that is the eternal loving part of them? Yeah. Well, I love this in this conversation and this, just this book, it was really, it was really insightful. And it was so funny because I looked at the title and I had started writing something a few months back about soul fulfilling. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, universe, what's happening? What's happening? Yeah. So, um, so let's go on to the next question. What would you say was one of the most impacting challenges you confronted in relation to love? And what was the wisdom you gained from a situation or that event? I mean, the... I think my life has been very orchestrated around understanding the difference between projection and true love energy. Mm -hmm. And Adam, it, we, you know, sometimes we hesitate talking about our love story because it actually is really unique and different. Mm -hmm. And we don't want make, to make people feel like, well, that hasn't happened to me. So what's <laughs> the point? Right. Because, because that isn't what I believe this loving creator wants from any of us. And I don't think there's like this hierarchy of love. I think it's, we all have an opportunity, like we're souls on a path. And I think we're always learning how to love. I think that's what we're doing here. We're becoming our most sainted selves, our version of love. And so every experience I see is a opportunity to actualize that or to kind of resist it. Yeah. And to me, that's my spiritual practice. That is my spirituality in a nutshell right there. And so my path with love has been a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. And so I had a like, I don't know, 10 year long relationship from when I was 13. Um, so those developmental big years that was with um, a person that there was like a lot of control and projection. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was so in love. This was going to be my husband. And then I started reading Marion Woodman and understanding union ideas of what projection was. And then it was kind of like, oh, this isn't love. Um, and I think also with intuition, I, my master's thesis was basically like, what's the difference between a projection mm -hmm. and a true intu intuition because they can feel very similar when you're in a projection. You're like, I know this to be true. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know whatever the projection might be like Muslims are wrong and they deserve to die. You know, like that can feel like someone's true connection to God, mm -hmm. but then it's like, and that's why the reason I'm using a big topic like that is because projections can be really dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. They separate us and they create wars. Um, or the projection like within what Nazi Germany or, you know, I mean, there's a million going on right now, but we also have the projections with our own souls and the projections in all our relationships. So it was really deeply important to me to get to like, how do you know something's true? Because a lot right. of people think they know things that are true. Right. But what is true with a capital T? And some people say there's nothing that's true. I mean, you could have a whole philosophical argument. Right. Meaning is what you make it. There's no such thing as true. And I really disagree with that, actually. Mm -hmm. I think there are some real spiritual truths. And I think love dominates over fear. And I think love dominates over hatred. But it's also hard sometimes to, it's like a hall of mirrors where when people haven't done their egoic work or have trauma or their own kind of wounds or programming, like if they're like, I used to work with girls and gangs in Palo Alto, they'd be in a family of Norteños or Sereños. They would be born into it. They'd only see red t-shirts in their house growing up or whatever. So it's like, 
the idea of breaking out of the system was like insane, you know, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. and dangerous because like yeah. these, these loving people might like come after their family. So what is love? Right. They would think that's love, but really it was just protection. And then you say, well, you're alone in the camp. Who's sending you letters? It's not your gang member friends. Yeah. Who's coming to visit you? Like, oh. It's your, it's your mother or whatever. Um, but so sorry, that was like a whole long rampage, but I think no, you're fine. You're totally <laughs> fine. And here, and I, and I totally got that because I worked with kids and families who were part of gangs in San Diego in Oceanside, California. And when I was coming up doing my master's and I got that, I got that. And I worked in children's services. And when you'd see a baby cry for their abuser, that's oh, God. what they knew. Yeah. That's what yes. was Oh my gosh. Familiar to them. And so yeah. my heart would break because I'm thinking they don't know any differently. And then when you see these adults that have been exposed to such abuse and they, they rationalize that abuse, you see yeah. what they're still suffering with. And, and you really see what's the difference between attachment and the energy of uh, love. I think oh. you have a front row seat to like what that is and where the, like you, we were talking a little bit about that epigenetic family ancestral trauma that's passed. Oh, yeah. Um, I think my path with love was kind of, yeah, discovering what is real love as an energy mm -hmm. versus my own attachment issues and projection and, and feeling like I was coming really out of an addiction with like codependency and, and having to go through that whole journey of learning about, and as an empath myself being kind of, I think empaths are a little more wired to be people pleasers because of our orientation to external energies. So I think in terms of the greatest lesson I learned was that I was in a marriage and not with that first boyfriend, but someone else after I had, had the strength to leave that first relationship once I understood projection was. Um, and I, I met Adam when I was in that relationship mm. and it was really like a showdown because I'm a very loyal person mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, my family culture was like, once you're married, that's it. That's you're doing that for life. Like that's a promise and a commitment. And my soul was telling me something different. My soul was like, this is your spiritual partner. This is who you're going to help bring love and healing to the world with. He sees your soul in a way like your per current partner isn't capable of. And my, my husband like is, and was just like a great person, like a really beautiful man. Good dad. There was not like some abusive situation or any kind of a problem mm -hmm. to point at, um, except for I was not feeling the connection on that level. Um, and so my almost like kind of personality instinct would have been to stay and sacrifice my desire for that type of union for the benefit of my child and my commitment that I had made. And then through soul journaling and understanding it's also not in my ex's best interest for a woman to stay with a man who knows that and sacrifice like from that energy of kind of like martyrdom and that was a really hard one for me I felt really torn by that because I you know really do not enjoy hurting people but it was also kind of something that was a soul lesson for all of us you know what he was meant to learn and my soul told me because I had been soul journaling for probably like 15 years at that point. Mm -hmm. um, well, she had told me two years before I met Adam, someone's coming for you and someone's coming for your husband in terms of your partnership. Mm -hmm. And I just like, was like, nope, <laughs> not hearing that, you know, plug the ears. Um, and he is remarried to a woman who's a much better fit and we co-parent beautifully and they live, you know, five minutes away. And it's, come to a really beautiful process. It's not that it wasn't hard, you know, at moments for sure. But I think that was my greatest lesson was understanding if you make a contract from fear or codependency, even if you think it's love, because on my wedding day in my first marriage, I thought it was love. Like I thought this was as good as it got. And I didn't know like a deeper unconditional love yet on a soul level. So then when that showed up, like I met him, and we actually started having like spiritual opening stuff together and like Kundalini symptoms and like crazy things at the beginning. It wasn't like, I was like, I, I, it wasn't even like a sexual attraction. It was more of like a resonance thing. So we would have these 
periods we would call love bombs where we would be like openings energetically for 15 minutes at a time. And we wouldn't even necessarily be physically together, but these things would happen at the same time. I felt like we were like two instruments tuning together to the same frequency. Right. Um, so Adam to me is the thing that I'm most proud of. Cause I was really scared to follow that direction. We've been together now 10 years and we have another child. Now our kids are seven and 13 and every day I'm just shocked. Like a love like this exists on the planet and I'm able to be seen and met psychically, energetically. So holy love is a product of what we learned from coming together in relationship. Cause I didn't know <laughs> I had the, the concepts of some of this, but I hadn't right. lived it um, until it was with Adam, but also thousands of sessions of couples of just doing kind of therapeutic work and right. seeing how useful it is for couples we talked all the time to people who would be on the brink of divorce and just because they're in an ego narrative. And once you just introduce them to their own soul and the soul of their partner, it's like a whole new relationship, right? It's like a whole new, Oh, this is available for us to meet at this place. Um, and then we have one chapter about tough love. Cause sometimes the soul information is to leave, right? Like, right. And um, so it's not rules of like, here's what you do in relationship. It's more, how do you access that part of you that knows what's right for you at this moment in all your relationships or with your children? Our older kid is 13 now, and he's getting more into that teen stage. And I'm really glad we have these skills because he's getting more introverted. <laughs> he's not expressing like three years ago how he's doing in the same way. So literally you have to be psychic sometimes to know what's kind of going on with him and, and to then help him kind of navigate it's hard being a teenager you know oh my goodness yes there's so <laughs> much we could talk about there's so much here that you've touched on that I just love to discuss and really kind of mull over because we could go down so many different roads you have touched on your book holy love the essential guide to soul fulfilling relationships the question I have is what is and how would you explain the difference between love and holy love yeah. Holy love is any type of love that moves beyond projection into the unconditional. So love without conditions. So much of our love is conditional. Like I'll love you if you do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that we throw away our boundaries or we enable any kind of bad or toxic behavior at all, but it's also like, do you have orientation to the unconditional element of your relationship? Um, I love that it made the back cover the we because I think this is the premise of the book. We can't live as soulmates if we don't know ourselves, and I would say and each other as souls. And I think that's the main issue we have is we're in a relationship where like something's missing, what's wrong? I feel like it looks good on these levels, but like I'm just not being met and seen on this level. That's like the most common complaint we hear. Um, they, maybe they don't even say it, but that's what's going on when you boil it down. And it's like, of course, if we're not doing the work or trying to orient to that part or even aware of that part, why would we be met on that part in our relationship? So the book is literally like, let's take it seriously instead of just throwing out soul. Because some people say, oh, my soul needed that. But they don't really think like, what is your soul? Like, yeah. What is that part of you? It's used colloquially as like, you know, um, I felt it in my soul, but they don't think for more than that. like. Right. That's a big statement. Like when you boil it down, like what is your soul? What is that part of you that doesn't change? That you, that is you as a baby. That is you when you're on your deathbed. Yeah. What is that essence to you? That's not your personality. That's not conditional that we fall in love with. I'm sure you had experience with clients too, where I would see these girls in the gangs and it, like, I would just love their souls and you want to like rescue everyone. And then you see the the situation the programming all of the trauma that they're going in the ego experience the narrative and then you're just like let me help you tap into what i'm seeing what i love about you <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I, <laughs> if you only knew the beginnings of that you know it's it's getting out of undergrad and going and working in a group home with kids from gangs too and it was five girls, five young women going in there and watching these egos and the lack of awareness of they're more than that. They're yes. more than that. You're, you are. Yeah. Soulful. And it's wild to and be like, I love your soul. And yet you might attack me. Like yeah. I remember being in group oh, yeah. I'm like, you could literally come physically 
knock me out at any moment. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, I feel like anyone who works in <laughs> rehab addiction group homes, like you're a spiritual warrior, like you are doing frontline work. And I was so traumatized by it. Like I would work crazy hours Monday through Friday. And then I would just sit in my San Francisco apartment. Like literally I wouldn't go out with friends. It'd be like Friday night from sun, you know, Monday morning, I'm staring at a wall in my room to deal with going to work on Monday with all the energy, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I learned so much about love and about addiction and about codependency and about being a spiritual warrior. Like, totally. yeah, <laughs> I it <get> wasn't. <laughs> I have friends. I'd be like, how are you getting your post-grad hours? And they're like, I'm doing uh, individual supervision, doing art therapy or something. I'd be like, that sounds really amazing. But um, I, I felt like I got to the place where I'm like, I can be in a room when someone's having a schizophrenic break and know what to do. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? When you don't get that training, if you're always in a cushy situation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, working in mental health and working in a lock facility for three years and you're doing crisis intervention constantly, people would say, how do you do that job? How do you, and for some reason, my strength, my internal strength, just, it it just came down and my function level came down to a really, uh, a place where it was very calm, very calm when I was in that. Yeah. Yeah. Where it was like, oh no, we've got crisis and yet I'm okay. We'll be okay. My husband's shocked about that part of me too, because I'm generally kind of a wired person. Like I can have anxiety. And then he's like, but when the crisis happens, he's like, you get like, cool. I'm like some kind of energy comes out of nowhere. Like (laughs) I know what to do here. (laughs) I get it. All those years of practice. Absolutely. I get it. So So thank you for explaining that. Yes, that is a big question about the soul. And I've heard you explain this about being an onion and what that looks like. Can you give us that example again, since people haven't heard it on this podcast of the soul and, you know, those layers and such? Yeah. I mean, I think our Western society is really built also about like skills and development. So it's always like, how can we add on to our onion, right? Of like you know, and those things are important. My son's in tennis lessons right now. You have to learn your alphabet. Like you have to do all the things, but connecting to your soul is about releasing layers, surrendering layers of conditionality and programming to find that core, the part of you that is eternal. James Hillman, the depth psychoanalyst has a beautiful book where he talks about, and I think about this all the time, the idea of the acorn and the oak tree in that the energy of the whole oak tree you know, is in that acorn and the destiny of the potential, you know, it needs conditions like soil and water and um, sunlight, but it's in there. And I think that's what the soul is like. I mean, that was my experience when I met my soul was just like, oh, you are watching every moment of my life with an unconditional love. Like you are as close as the next breath. And I'm down here like in monkey mind, you know, trying to maybe be validated or feel seen or like, you know, coming from a place of a feeling of separation. And it's really just remembering that that part of us exists and then turning. It's just a little tweak, you know, with such great payback and reward. It's such a good investment. I think there's like no better way to use our time. And again, it's kind of efficiency because the reality I see it as we're going to (laughs) die. And then we're going to have a life review. And that life review is basically from the energy of you as love looking at your life. And it's very like, it's not judgmental, like you're doomed to hell, but it's very much like, how'd you do? Yeah. Like to what degree did you listen to this part of yourself as you made your choices every day? And I do think they're kind of like tests because they're hard sometimes to make because we might have data or pressure to choose a different path, you know, whether like someone's like, you know, everyone in my family's doctors and I don't want to be a doctor. And I feel this little whisper to go be in Cirque du Soleil. (laughs) And like, do I do that? That seems really impractical, you know? And it's like, it's hard sometimes to listen to your unique version of love. And, um, so I think what 
connecting to your soul is, is giving people courage to know what they already know. Intuition to me is the voice of soul. And so when we hone our intuition, all we're doing is building that bridge to that eternal loving part of ourselves. I think a lot of psychic stuff can be seen as just like skills like that you train to get accurate hits. And to me, being psychic doesn't interest me. What interests me is using psychic tools and intuition to embody our soul. Otherwise, it's just to me like a magic trick. I'm not interested in just proving that that stuff exists. Um, I think it's it's more interesting when it's connecting into the proof of the divine, like proof that we are souls having a human experience. And um, then then I get lit up and then I'm really interested. Yeah, I love that because that does incorporate something that's tangible, practical, and strategic and really understanding the soul and not making it so out there that people can't grasp the concept. 90% of the time, my soul journaling is like, Sophia, because I we talk about identifying the personality of your soul and naming right. it because mm -hmm. as humans, if we don't have a name, we don't build a relationship. So it's really important, I think, to have that imprint of what does it feel like? And it can change over time. Sometimes people start with like, it feels like grace to me. And then you get to know it better. And it might, the name might get honed to lavender. Right. Now she's feeling like it, a lavender energy. And it, the, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just important that you call it and that right. you have that conscious relationship. So a lot of 90% of the time, Sophia's like, I'm like, why do I feel weird right now? <laughs> What's yeah. going on with me? What am I, where are my projections? Where am I kind of doing stupid, idiotic things that I think are smart. Cause that's the setup of the ego. Right. And she's just really clear and direct and accurate with me. I really trust her. It saves so much time. <laughs> it's right. like, it's really useful. Yeah, absolutely. And I love this, this whole transformation between understanding the ego part of that and your inner knowing your soul. And I love your whole concept about, Hey, we're all going to die. And eventually we're going to look back and have to do this like review. Right. And what I would call something like that is a soul appraisal. And, you know, <laughs> we're going through a house buying process. So that's funny. I, I think that's actually really, yeah, for real. Right. Yeah. And so uh, maybe that's your next book, the soul appraisal. I mean, because it's just, you know, as you're talking, what's the like, value oh, we call that? Oh, we call that a soul appraisal. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is because it, it's also has to do with consciousness, right? Because our soul is always valuable, but it's like, are we accessing and using it? Are we really integrating? We it's, it's kind of like, if you have, if you make a beautiful Turkey for Thanksgiving and then no one eats it, what's the point of the Turkey? That's how I see it with soul. It's like, but all of us have these moments of intuition. I think even people who don't see themselves as spiritual or intuitive have moments where sure. th they're connecting. But to me, I just like to make it conscious and turn up the volume instead of it being like, it comes to you when you're relaxed or yeah. once a year, how do we make it a part of our everyday life? So it's on command, on demand, when you need it, when you're having a panic attack, when your kid's sick and you don't know if you should take them to the hospital that night or not. Or so to me, it's really about application of, yeah. yeah. And, and I love that because like I said, it makes it more tangible. It makes it real for people to grasp use. Yeah. And, and that's so important to have that skill, that, that tool of being able to really tap into your, your, your soulfulness. So we've gone through quite a bit here and I have so many more questions. We are going to wrap this up because um, we've just gone through a lot, but again, I hope people hear what you're saying today, because it's so important. And this book can apply to so many holy love, the essential guide to soul fulfilling relationships, relationships, relationship with yourself, re relationship yes. with your understanding about A, B, or C, a relationship with another human. So it, it really, this book pertains to so many different types of relationships. So I want to ask you, as we come to the close of the interview, one last question, and that is, if you were to leave the listeners with some words of wisdom, what would those be? I think that this is more accessible than you think. And I think sometimes when people hear this stuff, it sounds so out there and they're like, I'm not a mystic or seeing things or, and it really doesn't matter. We do this with kids. I honed this with my lockdown girls, right? It's like, yeah. that's the, that's where it, this formulated was that was when I was going through my spiritual opening and I was figuring out what worked. And I was trying to help people. I think I've always been interested. I'm sure you have been as well in that question of like, what heals, mm -hmm. like what really helps. Right. And, and you have to get like 
quick and efficient about it um, when you have that kind of demand on you. And so I think what I want people to know is like, this is really doable. There's a part of you that is loving you right now in this moment, watching you in this moment. And you can utilize that part if you just turn and start to get curious to like, where is that part? What would that part say? If I fake it till I make it and pretend to know what love might say to me right now, what would that be? Because if you, and if you don't like the word soul, just say love, just talk to love. It's talking to the energy of love. One thing we like to say a lot is like, there's a real big difference about talking about love than talking to love. Mm. Cause now you're summoning it as an energy. Now you're inviting the energy of grace and healing into your life. And I do believe it's kind of like when you work with angels where you have free will and they won't come in unless you say, please help me. Mm -hmm. I'm open. So there's the humbling of the ego that needs to happen for that first step with the intention. So I think I just want people to know, play with it, try it. You don't have to, I'm not trying to convert. We're really not interested in like, you know, a belief system for anyone. We just want people to try the, the book. We have free meditations on our website. So guided meditations are a really good way to start. That's often the emails I'll get. People will be like, I didn't know about your soul stuff. And then I did the guided meditation. Then I saw this energy of my soul coming in. And I felt a lot and I started crying and they're like, why is this happening to me? Yeah. And it's happening because there's a part of you that's so excited that you're turning and coming back. And now you've got a partner in life to help you with everything. So yeah, whether you're single partnered or old or young, this book is for anybody in holy love. I've seen the most beautiful, some versions of holy love with monks or nuns that are celibate, right? Cause it's really just about that inner relationship and the relationship to the divine. So it's just, how do we have good relation. We are relational beings. So absolutely. Well, thank you, Elisa, for joining me on the core women podcast today. Thanks. I really appreciated talking to you. I love that you're a clinician because we wanted this book to be for everyone, but I kept telling Adam, I feel like the clinicians are also going to really get this book, the healers of the healers, because I think we, we understand how, how something needs to be useful and um, practical and also just like yeah, I, I just love that. That was your background. It was really fun talking to you about <laughs> that. Yeah. Thank you. I had a lot of fun as well. <laughs> Truly, this has been a treat. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. You can connect and follow Elisa Romeo on Facebook and Pinterest and on YouTube and Instagram on their pages, Holy and Human, as well as on her website, holyandhuman.com. You can also find her book on Amazon and other retailers. Thank you for joining us on the Core Women Podcast with Dr. Summer Watson. We're so glad you're here and would love to connect more with you. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Core Women and on Twitter at Core Women One. For more about Core Women and Dr. Watson, visit corewomen.com. Want more support and resources for amazing women like you? Great. Join Dr. Watson and Jen Fontanilla at the Life, Love, and Money Collective, a core women production that aids in understanding the key traits that might be getting in the way of living a life that you are absolutely passionate about. Connect with Summer and Jen and find out more at thelifeloveandmoney.com.